Shark, and we are Lady Bam. Now, our next guest is a very powerful, innovative gentleman in the restaurant business. We are so excited to speak with him and find out a little bit about how he is leading his company through this crisis. He's currently COO of Clyde's Restaurant Group based in Washington, D.C. He is a former co-founder, president, and CEO of Biagi's Restaurant Italiano. He's someone I know very well, which, by the way, podcasters, is why I was able to get him to come on our podcast, because I have an in, because I've actually known this man his whole life. So podcasters, you know how I'm always talking about my amazing clan. Well, today we are here to talk about my little brother, John, who's doing big things. Lately, I've had the great privilege of observing my brother's professionalism from a distance, and I'm really impressed with his leadership. So is Mina. We've been talking about this a lot, his intelligence, his enthusiasm. Mina, get, give us a little bit of what you observed in talking about John and looking at the kind of communication he's been sending out to his team. Hi, everyone. It's really been great to have the opportunity to see how John engages with his team. As I'm sure we're going to talk about today, I've just been so impressed with the encouragement he's been able to foster with his team through these really trying times and the problems that come up. And I imagine new issues that crop up every single day. And just to continually have such an uplifting sense when speaking to his team of, yep, we're just doing this. We're just going to move forward and make this work. And it's been really inspiring and something I think all of us kind of need to hear right now. So without further ado, Mina and I would like to welcome John McDonald to Lady Bam. Hi, John. Hi. Well, thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mina. It's a, it's a <laughs> pleasure to be on. Well, a few ground rules. No discussing yes, the fact I... that I was stuck in a trash can for, for, okay. for not giving up my bottle. Uh, yes, we really do. don't need to get into how much TV I watched as a kid. No, uh, or should we get into <laughs> what cereal you ate every day? The what? The cereal. I ate a lot of cereal, a lot of carnation instant breakfast. Wasn't it? Was it a lot of steakums, a lot of Stoker's French bread pizzas? <laughs> well, it's fair to say that it's a very interesting fact that you did not grow up eating a really diverse menu of foods as a child. No, our, our mom was a great storyteller. She was a great storyteller. That's right. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, yeah, I'll avoid some of those embarrassing moments like the trash can, but, you know, we'll see. Okay, John, we have a lot of young listeners out there, and they are looking to define um, their path, and they're looking for stories about what clicked for you, for example, as a young person. What made you decide to go? I know for a fact that you went to Cornell, you, you were hotel administration. Where was the impulse for that? How did you find that? Because it, it apparently turned into an, a phenomenal career. I would say um, what I've observed in this particular moment in time, it seems to be that you are right in the center of something that is kind of a calling. And so I just wondered if you could share with us, did you know that this was something that you were going to be amazing at or passionate about? Or did you just think, how did you enter college? How did that go? Well, let me get go back to the start of this business. And, and I don't think anybody, when they're young, ever thinks that they're going to be amazing at anything. <laughs> well, some people so, do. So let's let's just take that off the shelf now. So this but doesn't sound like a fairy tale. Pretty humble. But, yeah. uh, you know, there was a couple of things that really, really kind of pointed me in this direction. One, you know, as we both know, our mother was a fantastic storyteller, um, but nobody would claim her to be a fantastic cook. Right. She did right. love to eat out a lot. Right. And as I, the youngest of the family, was growing up, she and I dined together as a table of two a great <laughs> deal through my elementary school, junior high, and high school years, particularly at a place called Friendly's. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there was two of them, as you'll recall, on Trip Hammer Road across the street from each other. That's how huge the demand for Friendly's was in Ithaca Park. And that was my <laughs> first restaurant. inspiration for all of these restaurants that you know. Well, that was my first restaurant job. Was so friendly. We were eating at Friendly's all the time. And then when I was 14, I went to the Friendly's at Pyramid Mall and I lied about my age. 
and got a job as a dishwasher and busboy at the Pyramid Mall Friendlies at age 14. And it took me all of like three days to go, this is great for me because, you know, I was not a particularly good student and was definitely not motivated by scholastics. I absolutely cared about athletics and a restaurant to me felt just like a sports team. You had good players, bad players. You know, the, the manager was either a good coach or a bad coach. The team was either functional or dysfunctional. And you either succeeded with the people that came in that shift or you got your ass handed to you if you were a lousy right. team. And all of that made sense to me and was very right. comfortable. And I think, you know, like the rest of our family, we've all got hustle. So I get a lot yeah. of positive reinforcement pretty quickly in it. And that yeah. oftentimes has a big impact. And then, uh, you know, that and, you know, the other thing, I think from a food perspective, and I don't think you were around for this, but I, I mowed the lawn of these people named the, the Fioris mm-hmm. for about two and a half years. And they were at the corner of Warren Road and Hanshaw. It was a two acre <laughs> lot. Yeah. And I took the job. They were an old Italian couple. Um, she was 89 and he was 91 when I started in the job. And they had a rider mower. And this is the first time he had ever hired anybody at 91 to mow his lawn. They had an amazing Whoa. tomato garden. I know, incredible. And so three weeks into the job, he died horribly. And then five weeks into the job, the rider mower died. And I spent the next two summers dragging our, our push mower from our house over to their house half a mile away and doing a two-acre lawn while she would cook. Oh, my God. <laughs> So she would make, and they were both from Italy, born in Italy, and she would make like little handmade raviolis and what I guess now would be something along the lines of like an arrabbiata sauce. It was slightly spicy, fresh tomato sauce, basil. I had to start off by pulling the the tomatoes and the basil from the garden. She would make the ravioli. She would do everything while I was mowing because it would take me like two and a half hours to mow that lawn. Right. And then I'd come in and I would eat the living shit out of it, like only a teenager can. You know, when I started on this, I was 13. I'm playing summer league soccer. I'm like 5'10", 100 pounds, and completely starving all the time. Not because food wasn't available, just because, you know, that's how you are when you're a teenager. And so I really fell in love with Italian food and food in general. That makes sense. Did you tell mom at all about the other Italian food? Oh, constantly, just, yeah. You know, you know, yeah. and she was, you know, how our yeah. family is. She immediately knew that she was doing it all wrong. And Miss Fiore offered, by the way, to give yes. mom cooking lessons, but that did not go over great. <laughs> oh, no, I can't imagine. Well, and why would it? Our mother worked so hard, you know? It's like, so why, why would, I mean, and, and by the way, to set the record straight, she was a perfectly good cook. She did a lot yes. of dishes really well, and she had yeah. very little time to cook. So we're, we're being funny here, um, but she, she, she could handle herself in the kitchen. Well, she could handle herself in the kitchen, but she just wasn't that interested in food. And that's fine. Unless it was going out for it. She loved (laughs) being in a restaurant because it was great space. You know what I mean? She didn't have to do anything. She could really engage with you. you And she loved being in public. That's what I know. Did I ever tell you what happened at my opening on Broadway, my Broadway premiere? What mom did? Uh, At Starbucks? Probably, but I'd love to hear it again. It's wonderful because it, it speaks to her, you know. She was so vivacious. She, we come into Sardi's and, you know, Sardi, it was still like the old fashioned way where you go to Sardi's afterwards and they read the reviews, you know, as soon as the right. paper comes out at like 1130 and we go over to Sardi's and there are people eating in Sardi's, but the, the Broadway opening party walks through the restaurant and people just traditionally just clap for you because right. they know you open and then you go to a different part. And mom and I walk in and they see me and you know there's a sort of like polite applause very kind but nobody really knew me as an actress yet and um and but then the applause started to swell and I thought I knew the other actors were already there because mom and I had taken a walk and I was kind of like wow I guess my performance was more impressive than I thought you know I I didn't have many lines and I um, suddenly turned around and she was taking bows as the actress's mother and she was blowing kisses and I was like 
Stop. Come sit down right now. And she goes, oh, please. This is once in a lifetime. Let me have some fun. <laughs> and the more she enjoyed it, the louder they clapped. They just loved her to bits. Yeah. And John Spencer, the late, great John Spencer, who's in the play, he saw the whole thing before I did. So he got up out of his chair, he pulled out her chair, he clapped over her head. It was the, it was the greatest memory uh, in the world, right? It's still her. Yeah, and she loved going to Sardis. Like you said, she yeah. loved going out. And, yeah. Okay, so you went to Cornell, mm -hmm. right? Talk about that. You majored in hotel administration, is that correct? It is, and you know, what, one other thing I would add to that, which kind of, I think it's a story worth telling and getting into Cornell and, and deciding to, because you started off, I think, Mina, you were talking about encouragement and, and how yeah. powerful that can be, you know, and sometimes when it's placed at the right moment. And, you know, back then, you know, the late 70s, early 80s, you didn't get many compliments on your work. You know, you just kind of work like, boy, I hope they don't fire me because you, you, you never knew what your boss was thinking. And you presumed you were always just like one extra Coca-Cola while you're working away from losing your job. And <laughs> and so I had this this dishwashing job in prep cook job at another restaurant that's going to go on name. And um, so I was a uh, rising senior. It was like summer between junior and senior year. And mm -hmm. I decided, you know, it was it was about time. We're at the beginning of senior year and I'm, I'm filling out college applications. I decided that I would apply to the hotel school Cornell and everything else I was applying to was like the rest of our family, you know, arts and sciences. Because, you know, that's what we were supposed to do. But Cornell, you know, had a good program and I was really liking the restaurant business. And I was working in a restaurant where the owner was a graduate. Right. So once I got to work and I caught up on all my dishes and I caught up on my prep, I went out to the bar where he ruled from. Yeah. And uh, interrupted him at his cocktail and cigarette. Um, did the old, you know, Mr. Hyder, sir, do you, do you, do you think... Uh, I could talk to you for a moment. I was thinking about applying to the hotel school at Cornell. I'm hoping maybe you can write me a recommend. And I get that far and he cuts me off and he goes, stop there. Let me do you a favor. This business will eat you up and spit you out. Good Lord, you're kidding. He says, oh my go God. a different direction. You're a smart kid. And I was <laughs> like, uh, oh, hey, thank you, sir. You know, back to my dish room. <laughs> You know, and, and, and honestly, I was, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And anything could have pushed my boat in any direction, as long as it was a direction. And so I went back to the dish room. And, and I, if it just left there, I probably wouldn't have actually applied because I was on the fence on it anyway. And if you've got a boss who's a, a, an alumni and he won't even write your recommendation, I feel like myself, well, then they'll know that I'm not legitimate, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm in the dish room for about five minutes. And this guy, Steve, who is the general manager, comes and grabs me. And he says, hey, do you have a minute? Can we sit down and talk? And I'm thinking, oh, no, shouldn't ask for a recommendation. I'm going to get fired. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So he sits me down. He goes, hey, I'm really sorry about, you know, what he said about the business. I overheard the conversation. And he goes, you know, I just I want to tell you two things. One, I would love to write your recommendation. Wow. Honestly, I've been in this business a long time, and I've never had anybody work as hard as you. You oh are my God. always here early. You always get your stuff done, done faster than everybody else. You don't, you, you, afraid, you act like you're afraid to take a soda break. You are driven. If you <laughs> decide to get into this business, you will be a huge success. So please <gasps> let me write a recommendation for you. I had never gotten oh a compliment at work, God. right? And I'm also, you know, you're a teenager, you're emotional. So I start crying. Oh, I mean, not like, you know, I wasn't, you know, no, for I lunch, get no, but, you I, but, I, but like yeah. I was a little choked and misty eyed and I needed a second to gather myself. It well, was you're just Irish. Come on. incredibly That's overwhelming, you know, yeah. and, yeah. you know, if he didn't take what ended up being four minutes, we're not here having this conversation right now. You know, that, oh, that's my. just a fact. Yeah, just a fact. Because I was so on the fence of applying to that program. Every other program I was applying to had nothing to do with the hospitality industry. Wow. wow. I was right on the edge and a little bit of encouragement at the right time. And you, did you ever see him again? Um, yeah, I saw him a couple times because Cornell was in Ithaca. So yeah. I would go into this restaurant occasionally and say hello and, and check in. Yeah. So I, you know, I saw the whole crew there for a couple of years, but I haven't talked to any. Actually, that's not true. There is a cook. The guy who was the, technically the chef there. I still communicate sometimes on Facebook so 
Oh, isn't that lovely? You yeah. know, I find those stories amazing because we, meaning I'm in his shoes right now, he did a lovely thing, mm -hmm. but he actually changed your life and put you on yeah. your path. Yeah. And we, you know, we don't always know that we've done that. Right. You know what I mean? Because I'm sure you've done that for other people too. And someday they'll, see, you know, you'll be walking around and they'll say, hey, aren't you John McDonald? You said something to me once. Right. <laughs> Well, this reminds me of a story that I want to share with you, John. It's about mom. The actor Tim McKay, you know who he is. He's fabulous, this handsome, wonderful, talented guy. He's done a million things. You've seen him on so many beautiful TV shows and movies. Anyway, Tim McKay was born in Ithaca, it turns out, and he grew up in Lansing. And we were at an event one time, and he pulled me aside and he says, I have a story about your mother that I want to share with you. And he told me a story about when he was a young boy, he had a crush on a girl and he wanted to get her a ring. And so he walked in to Marty's gift shop. I'm pretty sure. Ah, yeah. And he said, um, there was nobody in there and there was this lady working and I'd been in there before with my mom and stuff. And I had registered that that lady seemed kind of friendly and nice. So she said, can I help you, young man? And he goes, well, yeah. And he goes, I was really scared to tell her. And I said, I, I have a crush on this girl and I want to get her a ring. And she goes, oh, well, I can definitely help with that. And then ah. she spent some really quality time with him. And he bought the ring and took it home and gave it to the girl and would report to her later on his girlfriend. And he went to see her years later when I think she was at the close horse to say hi. Isn't that lovely? That's so lovely. John, let's get back to you. So you go graduate from Cornell and then your first job was in DC, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. I, yes. um, so one of the nice things about that program is people, a lot of companies would interview at school. It was a very easy place to get a job from. You know, most people okay. would graduate with a lot of job offers. And uh, I was not most people. I had one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great one. It could you not know, have been better. Um, it was a company called the American Cafe. And at that time in D.C., yeah. they were really doing edgy stuff. It was like it was casual, full service dining, but in a California spa cuisine approach but doing yeah. it at very affordable prices. And they had grown very successfully in DC and Baltimore. So <laughs> I got a job at their original flagship one on the corner of Wisconsin and M in yeah. Georgetown in Washington, DC, the American cafe and their corporate headquarters were right upstairs, which was really good. So you got a lot of time with people who were in power. And it was my first job out of college. And I immediately became the closing manager because the GM only wanted to work days. And the kitchen was open until 3 a.m. on weekdays and 4 a.m. on weekends. So I spent my first year out of college working six nights a week from 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. Amazing. Yeah, the only Is days that... I had were for lunch and breakfast. And... I, I think I visited you yes, during you that did. job. Didn't you I? Did. And I was on my way to shoot Mate One or something. I think that sounds right. Yeah. It's and a little throw. place. You come down a couple of steps um, right at the corner of Wisconsin. Well, 100 yards off the corner next to Rick yeah. Bank. And, you know, ironically, our corporate offices and my office now is yeah. about 400 feet from there. That's amazing. So I have gone my full career to end up on the same corner. That's the best. I know, I right? I really love that. That's yeah, so it's, wonderful. It's cool. So I did that for a year. And yeah. about a year is all I could take. You know, I, I wanted to stick it out a year. I learned a ton, but obviously working late at night, every night after living La Vida Loca, being in a fraternity in college was, was a pretty abrupt <laughs> yeah. that was not good for the soul. I then left there to take a waiter job uh, yeah. in a, in a high-end formal dining, a place called the Potomac where yeah. it was captain, front waiter, back waiter, and I had to wear a tuxedo as a captain. And I know, I went there too. Yes, you did. With my in-laws. And, uh, and it was, it's the same owner as Tavern on the Green, so it looked like right. Tavern on the Green in Washington, D.C., basically. Correct. I'd never done, like, formal service, front of the house service. And yeah. most of my career was mostly kitchen. So it was a really great opportunity to kind of take a step out of management and learn some really great skill sets. It, it was the best job I ever took because I met Jamie there. And now yeah. we have 29 years of marriage. But I also learned a ton and it really legitimized me in fine dining. 
and that that's kind of where my career just stayed and 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 got more interesting for a couple of years and and added versatility and and uh, I worked there for a couple of years and then I made this glorious transition to a company called the Clyde's Restaurant Group, the one that I I now run and so this is my second tour of duty there and. John Latham, the guy who is the deceased CEO and one of the founders of, yeah. of Clyde's was a really inspirational guy. And I, my first interview with him was about three and a half hours long. Um, we smoked a full pack of cigarettes together and about two hours <laughs> of the interview, we started drinking. And, oh my God. Um, and it, we could not have connected more. And this is a company that you know, they were farm to table in the 1980s. You know, they were That's amazing. so many cool things. and. It was saloon dining and, and yeah. just really a visionary. And, and I had a really terrific run with them at a couple of different restaurants running 1789 and the Old Ebbett Grill, which was then and still is the busiest restaurant in Washington, D.C. And Amazing. then, uh, yeah, so that's and, and now here I am years later back at Clyde's kind of it's kind of like being coming back to be the principal of the high school you went, to, you know. Oh, that's a wonderful way to put it. You left uh, Clyde's to start the Biagi's franchise, is that well, correct? Not exactly, not exactly. I, I, left, I left Clyde's and for about a year and a half, I worked for the company Morton's, the high-end steakhouse. Oh, that's right, I forgot about that one. Yeah, and, and I did that because I, I was still pretty young and I wanted to see different ways of doing things. And the thing about Clyde's is a lot of the GMs, you know, are there for life. And right. I wasn't ready for the GM for life kind of thing. And so I wanted to see some different ways. and. And I went to Morton's, which honestly was a really great move because Morton's uh, it was then was kind of like the, the McDonald's of fine dining in a sense, because everything was so systemized and, and so regimented. It was like an accounting firm that sold steaks. And, um, <laughs> and that was really great because I learned a whole ton of controls that I didn't have before that, you know, it really yeah. sort of expanded my bag of tricks. And yeah. it was Morton's then that I left to start that Samore. Because oh, right. my oh, first my partners, Freddie and Artie, Fred Berman yeah. and Artie Altshuler, fantastic people, um, they were customers there. So that's how we got hooked up. And they were in their late 60s. Wow. And I'm in my late 20s. And they had a business plan, which like I think they wrote on the back of a beverage napkin, and talked me into joining them. And we raised money. And I left Morton's. And I, I left Morton's in like, I want to say... You know, October of one year, and we got the first that Samore open in February, and then over the next six years, grew it to to seven locations. And I was chief operating officer. And you know, at this point, they're in their seventies, so they're not really doing anything every day other than you know, kind of like dining. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, not that they they were wise people, but we didn't yeah. have like a great collaborative effort. Right. You know, I, I was right. kind of wearing all the hats and, and uh, they were holding up the scoreboard. And, but w if I was doing a good job, they were cheering me on. If I was doing a bad job, they were still cheering me on. Like they were, yeah. you know, they, they yeah. were really good dudes. But, but sometimes you want somebody who challenges you more, you know? Yeah. And so in 1998, when, you know, that's more he's doing pretty well. We've got our seven restaurants. We had more slated to open and, um, a guy, a recruiter that I was using, an executive recruiter to find managers for our company, asked me to do him a favor and talk to this guy in the Midwest who was trying to start a restaurant company, an Italian restaurant company, which that's Amore, of course, was, I guess by the name. And this guy had never worked in the restaurant business, but had an MBA from Northwestern, had a great financial background, and had already talked a bank into giving him a million dollars, despite the fact that he had never worked in a restaurant. Wow, that's a personality. I'm like, yeah, I would love to talk yeah. to this guy. This yeah. guy's really, he's yeah. a cool dude. You know, I wasn't thinking about moving or changing. I was just like, so. How'd you so do I, that? I, uh, and they gave me, they actually gave me a free placement in the company from giving him a couple hours on a Saturday morning. So, so Todd Hovenden, uh, who I'm speaking of, and I talk on a phone on a Saturday in 98, and it's like a four hour phone call. And I, I get off, which obviously anybody listening now would not be surprised because it's hard to get me to shut up. But so I get up. <laughs> We get off the phone and I say to Jamie, uh, wife Jamie, you know, who grew up in Washington, loved Washington, never wanted to leave Washington. I said, do you know where Bloomington, Illinois is? And she said, no. <laughs> and I said, because I think we're moving. And uh, so, uh, you know, then, of course, as you know, we were divorced. 
<laughs> no, just kidding. Just kidding. We're still, <laughs> you are just kidding. Um, for the great listeners out there. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, for me, it was really great because when we started that some more, I, I made an infinite number of mistakes and did so many things wrong in growing that, you know, because it's your first time. And I was young. I was probably too young to be embracing that. So a chance for a redo was mm. really, really powerful. And a redo with a partner who really, we we're about the same age and we had a lot of similarities and he has just incredible financial acumen. It was a really smart business plan. So it really made sense. And so I ended up joining him and sold our interest in that Samore and bought a house in Bloomington, Illinois. And Jamie and I and our two children moved from DC to the middle of the state of Illinois. <laughs> did that because I know it's you had a crazy. great house. It was a great house. You can your money goes a long way there. It goes a yeah. long way there. So um, you know, part of the reason of Bloomington is Biagi's, as as you you know, you certainly dine there, which is was and still is a wonderful company. You know, polished casual Italian. We built the concept to focus on third tier markets of the Midwest. So it was a specific niche we were appealing to. You know, that sort of. 150 to 500,000 in population, primarily white collar white workforce, high average household income, and big yeah. enough to support what we were doing, but small enough that most national chains of polished, you know, polished casual would view yeah. it as too small and not go there. So that it was sort of a hit them where they ain't strategy. And yeah. yeah. So you know, we got the first one open in 1999 and he and I are both living there. We've got mortgages and no restaurants yet producing any, any sales. So it was pretty right. nervous. And Ooh. then we started growing it and it was successful. And it certainly was. By the way, listeners, Consumer Reports in 2009, Biagi's tied for highest customer satisfaction in all categories in 2012 the highest for Italian chain and eventually highest for all chains in all price points. In all That's of America. Good. In yeah. all of America. Yeah. And that That's wasn't amazing. just in, thank you. And and that's having restaurants in 12 different states. You know, we grew it to, to 24 locations in 12 states. So we were pretty spread out. And I think we're still able to preserve a very good culture and a very high level of execution and, and engagement, emotional engagement with our employees because that's really the heart of what makes anything good is engagement. So it was a great run. And, you know, then it, when we started that company, you know, to go back a little, it wasn't, yeah. a, it wasn't a plan where we would, we would start it and run it forever. The idea was that we put the business plan together with an exit strategy. For investors, the idea was to buy into the company, let us grow it, and then we'll sell it and everybody will make a ton on their investment. Right. Sell it or go public and do right. and, you know, right. do that. And the, the original plan, we were trying to get to 20 restaurants in five years, and we didn't do that, but we, in five years, we were at around 16, so we were pretty damn close. But we just never got to that point of selling it. And uh, we had a couple of offers, but each time we'd look at them, the offer, when you compared it against the net present value of cash flow over, say, 15, 20 years, it always made more financial sense to hold on to the company than it did to sell it. Right. Uh, which makes great financial sense, but it doesn't make great spiritual sense if you're yes. Donna Jamie McDonald who want to get back to the East Coast, right? Right, right. So, you know. Jamie. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. What a trooper. He needed so, to go. Yeah. So in uh, 2015, you know, and at that point, my partner Todd had had stepped back from the company a bit, and I was president and CEO. Before that, I was president; he was CEO, and he also and primarily functioned as a chief financial officer because, again, that's where his acumen was really tremendous. Not that his acumen wasn't good in, in other areas; he's an incredible person. But um, you know, it's 2015; both the kids are off to college. And so because of that, you know, we're not, they're never coming back to Bloomington and we're getting a taste of what the rest of our life was going to be, um, <laughs> you know, in Bloomington, yeah. we're, we're so far away from everybody we love in a town that we're really not suited to, you know, we were only going originally for five years and moved back to the East coast. So it was time. And, yeah. um, you know, so 
since we hadn't sold the company, you know, I, I couldn't monetize my ownership that way. But one thing we did very well with the company is build a lot of cash on our balance sheet. So the company had the cash to buy out my position. And right. so, so Todd and I worked out a very fair price. And, um, you know, I spent a couple months getting the organization sort of restructured for my departure. And uh, we had a beautiful ending, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, made a lot of money on the exit, which is good, which allowed uh, Jamie and I to take a really fun year. And I took yeah. a year off from working and started off with five weeks in Europe, and then went on a tear of, you know, creative writing classes and yoga. I know, I remember. You're a good Backpacking writer. and yeah. 132 pickup games of hockey in 12 months. Let me ask so, you a question. Let me ask you a question about that period because I... I know so many sort of semi-retired individuals at my age and in the business that I'm in, it's never clear if you're retired or not. Right. And so when you were in that beautiful period of traveling and doing things that were kind of nourishing to you and to Jamie and your, your lives together, was there anything pushing in your mind about work or did you just go blank for a while? Uh, Do you remember? I, I did go blank for a while, but unfortunately, not long enough, right? Huh. Because I look back and say, I, I feel like I squandered that year because the oh. reality was like the first three months were Shangri-La of self-actualization. Yeah. The yeah. next three months were Shangri-La with, I should probably start thinking about what I'm going to do next. And then the last six months were like, I really got to figure out what I'm going to do. And I really don't want to live here anymore. And where are we going to go? <laughs> like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Then, you know, you're, you're spending all your time chewing your nails and not, you know, self-actualizing yeah. anymore. So um, yeah. it's really tough, I think, <laughs> you know, I think it'd be real, it's, it's, I think it's a lot that. easier to actually retire than to, you know, the way yes. we did it, I didn't know it was next, but I knew there was going to be a next. No, and that's I wasn't I, that's worried I, about finding a next. Yeah. yeah. But when you don't know what that next is, it can be unsettling and that unsettling aspect can get in the way of really making the most out of every day so yeah it was that, great that is, six months were great three months were spectacular three months were pretty damn good and then three months the back sucked. six months was you know <laughs> fixing the house trying to sell it thinking about where i'm going next and knowing that we're yeah. getting out of there and also then feeling so sad about leaving all the people behind the relationships that we had built over 17 years yeah that's where our kids had grown up yes. because we knew we wanted to come back to the east coast you know Right. No. Okay. You know, I can relate to it all. And so many of our listeners can who are older and who are more my peers in that many people who follow this podcast are in the entertainment business. So we go through semi-retirement, that sort of place that you described so beautifully, which is, oh, at first you're elated project ended or you get to a certain age or whatever and you know it's going to change you've been working really really hard in a very specific tunnel for a long time and then you start because you don't know what's next but you do know there's the next and I think that's unusual because a lot of people they finish they retire and now it's retirement okay so coming back to Clyde's how did that happen John so I was um starting to interview and I didn't want to start another company, you know, that I knew because I'd gotten to the point, you know, we had 2000 employees at Biagi's in a, in a pretty uh, solid corporate infrastructure. And I really liked leading a corporate team. And when right. you start something new, you got to go back to wearing a lot of hat hats rather yeah. than driving strategy with, you know, specialists around you to sort of execute it. And that was really more the plane I wanted to stay on. So, you know, it was pivoting back to, to running somebody else's company, basically. Yeah. And, so, you know, things were going quite well. There was a lot of interest and, and there was a, a company I was talking to and, you know, it was for a uh, chief operating officer position. And the person who was president uh, of the company had worked with somebody that I used to work with. And so I wanted to get a hold of them. And uh, I called my good friend, Tom Meyer. And, and Tom yeah. uh, was and still is the president of Clyde's because I knew Tom would have this guy's number. And then we started talking. and. It took us about to about ten minutes to get to the point where we realized that um, that I was really the right person to come back and run the company. You know, Tom was a corporate chef and he's a very creative individual. Mm. Um, and sometimes that skill set is not the same set as being the sort of 
leadership tactician and yes. operations driver. Right. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to wear both hats, in fact. And and so he was trying to do both, and and that wasn't really suited to him. And so it, we figured out that you know we'd be Clyde's would be a whole lot better with with me running things and and him getting to be the creative person he is. And mm -hmm. and it's worked out really well. And and actually, it's really worked out well for him on a lot of creative levels outside of work. He's he's become a painter who's getting an incredible amount of recognition and attention. And, Isn't that lovely? And he's becoming very it's becoming very financially successful for him, which not many artists can say, you know. So yeah. um yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, I get to do what I do. And and so, you know, it, it made a lot of sense. I came out to DC and, and met with some other executives on the team and we decided that it was the right thing to do. And and thus I came back. And that was in October of 2016. Right. And, right. uh, you know, Clyde's a little bit of background for the, for the listeners out there. You know, it's the Clyde's Restaurant Group is an institution, an absolutely iconic institution in Washington, D.C. for very good reason. The first one opened in 1963. Uh, that in was the year you were born. I find the that. The year I was born. Yes. 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 You and Clyde's were destined. No, there's no question about it. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> So, you know, over time, they grew at a profound yet slow pace, slow paced by like, say, Biagi standards. But each time they opened, they they did these amazing properties. And, you know, Clyde's would spend sometimes up to $20 million on a, on a fit out for a restaurant. And, you know, there's no facilities like this in the greater D.C. area. And the company, so it's it's 11 properties. The company on a whole does about $135 million a year in sales, uh, 2,000 employees, you know, and again, has been sort of a leader in the restaurant industry in DC, you know, going back to early 60s. So that's that's quite an incredible run to sustain revel, you know, relevance over yeah. that much time in the restaurant business. How many restaurants are in the Clyde's group? There's eight Clyde's with the name Clyde's that operate as, as Clyde's. And uh, there's uh, two of those in DC, three in the Northern Virginia suburbs of DC, and then three in the Maryland suburbs of DC. And then the company also has the Hamilton and the Hamilton Live. And uh, the Hamilton is, again, all of the restaurants are sort of around that polished saloon dining feel. Saloon which dining. Is just a great feeling. It's my favorite. Bar oh, energy, really yeah. imaginative food, warm Dark wood. Of wood. Yeah. And big, you know, these are big ones, lots of bars in them and lots of rooms. And the Hamilton and the Hamilton Live is an amazing property on 15th Street in DC. And does about 23 million a year in sales, which is a really big restaurant number. And the Hamilton Live, which is in the basement, is a music venue that does seated performances up to seating about 400, 450, and standing room closer to 700, and just an incredible property. And then on the other side of that block is sort of our crown jewel, the Old Ebbett Grill. Yeah. And the Old Ebbett Grill is the oldest surviving liquor license in Washington, D.C., uh, wow. One of the bars in the old Ebbett Grill is called the Grant's Bar because Ulysses would, you know, consistently pass out at it and have to be carried out. Apparently, he could really tip him back. There's a great painting of him in that bar. And, uh, you know, it's it's not still at the original location where Ulysses would right. pass out. It's around the corner. But, uh, you know, the yeah. Ebbett does about $35 million a year in sales. It's the, yeah. I mean, currently the fourth busiest restaurant in America. But it has half the per person check average of the top three. So it's doing much more volume. Oh, isn't and, that lovely? Uh, yeah. And it's, it's, you know, two blocks from the White House, which obviously helps. But it's yeah. more than just that because there's plenty of other restaurants in that block not doing what we are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then and in addition to that, we have 1789 in the Tombs, which you've also yeah. been to. And that's in a 200-year-old building over near Georgetown campus. Yeah. 1789 is luxury dining and the tombs is, you know, casual college rascaler experience for Georgetown University students. And that actually was opened in 1961 by a guy named Richard McCooey, graduated from Georgetown. And he sold it to Clyde's in the 1980s. Mm. And so mm. it's got tremendous history and tradition and just a wonderful property. So it's a really cool collection of restaurants. But... The great uh -huh. thing about them is that no two restaurants have the same menu. You know, it's right. Clyde's you could right. call a chain, but you know, chains typically have a formatted rest uh, menu. Right. And we have actual chefs who, and we reprint the menus every week in every restaurant. So, you know, we're always in a position to take advantage of seasonality and 
We're the largest buyer of local produce in the Washington, D.C. area. So it's, it's a really cool format to be high volume, yet at the same time, a lot of room for autonomy for our employees. Well, let me ask you a question here. I, I want to move into the COVID experience. Okay. Mina had this question, which I, I, I call, well, Mina, you could ask it. You had a, a question regarding John's position or his daily activity pre, how did that change immediately? Or what, what was your question, Mina? Do you remember? I would love to get a sense of before COVID, what your involvement with each restaurant and teams and kind of on the ground involvement was versus it seems like now you are very, you know, much more involved perhaps. Yeah. Uh, in the day-to-day -day and the, the independent operation of each one? How does that change? That's a really great question. You know, if it, if it weren't for the, the terrible elements of the pandemic, I would say I like this better. <laughs> Cause, yeah. cause it's not that dissimilar. So to give you an idea, before this, I, I, the majority of my time was spent in our corporate office, okay? So, which in a sense is, is distanced from the restaurants because you know, you have a lot of areas that you're trying to drive in my position, you know, marketing, finance, accounting, uh, operations, culinary, human resources, training, marketing. You know, there's, there's so many different corporate arms that drive that kind of a business that you've got to be stationary to really be in, involved with all of it and keep the team pointing in the same direction. So, you know, it was, it was working in a really cool Clyde's of Georgetown, our corporate offices in the building that we own, it was built in 1860. So the top floors are our corporate offices. So we had this really awesome setup there. So I'd be there and have a lot of interaction with the corporate team every day. I would say 80% of my time would be spent in the corporate office and 20% of the time being in the restaurants. Hmm. And being in the restaurants, it was typically if you wanted to, you know, you wanted to have a meeting with somebody over a meal or if you, there was something going on there where you had to make a decision about facility or design changes or construction or, you know, speaking to the staff about something, not like walking around the dining room going, hey, you know. So that was kind of the, the before and the after quickly moved to a working from home uh, as opposed to going into the office. And I certainly could go into the office. It's only like a 10 minute drive, but yeah. there's really no reason. Nobody's there. No and one's there. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I'm working more now than I have in years because the thing about working from home is that you never stop working. So I pretty much get up every day at about around six o'clock and I make the coffee and I let out the dogs. And then I wander over to my computer and I start working. And the first thing I do every day is check the sales and start writing the, the morning report, which goes out in an email group to, you know, the 190 some salaried employees that we have in the company just to, to keep some normalcy so that we're all connecting over something every day, which I love doing. And then it's about creatively looking for ways to increase revenue and prepare ourselves for all the pivots as they come. So to give you an yeah. idea in the last couple of weeks, uh, I bought 15,000 square feet of plexiglass because we figured the price of plexiglass was going to go up. Yeah. Everybody's going to need it. And it turned out to be a smart play because the price has tripled. And so we've been measuring and fitting our restaurants for these plexi dividers so that we can have greater capacity and safety. I was looking at the pictures, John, and I was just tickled by it. There's a demonstration for the listeners of this amazing apparatus that they can kind of, they could hook into a bar, they can connect to different places in the restaurant depending on the size of your party it expands or decreases is that correct so it's yeah, like so, portable well, walls yeah so it's it's like a mobile wall that's yeah. kind of contoured for a bar that comes up yeah and um it's actually it's pretty cool because it's made out of some fairly inexpensive materials the frame is is polystyrene which is really strong and not expensive and it's on yeah. casters on wheels and the whole thing, including materials right now, we're, we're producing for about $400 a divider. And yeah. that's actually, and that's a custom. So you figured the more that, and we developed it with these guys who, who are able to fabricate it for us. Okay, so let me, think hold, about on, that if, hold on, hold yeah. on a second. I want to go back, just, I want, there's two things I want to go back to. I, want, I will come back to this, but I right. want to go back, back before we get too far into where you are now. 
some of our the people that we've been talking to lately, we've been asking the same question to each person. During the transition from, you know, before COVID into operations during COVID. Yeah. Do you recall, I started reading in the emails that you were sharing with me, beautiful emails that you were sending to your team around March 18th, right? Yeah. And at that point, you were talking about credit card takeout. Um, should you promote it or should you not promote credit card sales? Would gratuities go to the relief fund for the workers, for the hourly workers? Should 20% of all sales go? These were the kind of questions you were proposing. So you're at the beginning of the envisioning what this new world would look like for your yeah. workers. What were the few days for you that led to the beginning of the new vision that is the world that you're creating now that currently has you buying plexiglass? What happened to you during those few days? How quickly did you realize what needed to be done? Was it a slow dawning? Was it, um, were, did you feel ahead of the game? What'd you go through? Yeah, that's a great question. So March 10th, Monday, March 10th. Yeah. That was the time when things were escalating at a point where it was apparent that our world was going to change rapidly. Mm. So that during that week, I pulled our team together and hit them with like a whole bunch of different scenarios. And at that point, you know, it was like, what if the most draconian thing you can imagine where they actually shut down restaurant operations happens? What are we going to do? Right. Probably. Yeah happen but let's be ready for it right and that was like march 10th and by march 17th or 16th oh so march 9th monday march 9th by march 16th it was all the game was over so we went we changed like how we operated like three times over the course of one week as like yeah. things started descending and then by saint patrick's day yeah there was no on-premise service so yeah. uh saint patrick's day was really the turning point but it was that week before that I think we did a really good job getting our shit together, preparing for the worst case scenario that happened to become true. And now, I think we had a head start on a lot of others. And do you think that you personally felt comfortable in that transition? Because it seems to me that you did. You're the kind of guy, as you stated, who likes to go into the fight and meet it. So did it seem, was it frightening or were you just, to a certain extent, I don't want to say excited by the challenge because it sounds terrible because people yeah. got sick and died. But I was very seemed, comfortable in it. You were comfortable in it. I was very comfortable in it. You know, that's interesting. So you think about it, like through my, the course of my career. I mean, if you've ever talked to anybody who's opened a restaurant, you know, going through the the process of opening a restaurant is yeah. can be a very disturbing and frightening thing from stress. Yeah. Standpoint, you know, it is kind of like managing chaos. And, you know, I've, I've opened 34 restaurants now in my life. It's so amazing. mobilizing things quickly towards an eventuality and getting people to say, yes, this is going to happen and this is what we're going to do is kind of an exercise I've done a couple of times a year through my career in opening all those restaurants. So I think that the kind of pivot that you have to drive quickly for this is so similar to all the things that you have to face all the time when you're trying to get a restaurant open and things start not going your way. Um, right. and you have to get right. pushed back or something happens with construction or you lose something with regulation or you know. So that kind of space, trying to navigate through it, get people looking at the opportunities the same way and then coax order out of all of that is what I've been wired to do my whole career. John, I read on March 28th, you said, I'm going to take the bet that all of our operations and respective teams to lesser and greater degrees can step up the procedural vigilance, be dogmatic and innovative. And I was fascinated by that because a lot of what people have expressed and a lot of what we see and a lot of what people is, is that people are constantly having to overcome fear in those moments and so the communication wasn't clear and the assumption wasn't necessarily that the teams or the co-workers would step up and do the right thing but what i see in your emails is a continual infusion of your belief that they will 
and you're challenged for them to do so. Is that something that is just inherently in your management style? Is that you or is that something you were inspired or you learned from a mentor or do, do you just know that that's how to get the best? Because that's an unusual thing to have to be inspiring during fear. Um, I, you know, that's a really great question. I think that that inspiring, again, inspiring different, different, during fear or maybe a better word would be during stressful circumstances. Yeah. Um, is something that's kind of becomes ingrained in anybody who manages in the restaurant business. Hmm. It is inherently frightening. I mean, you get overwhelmed, <laughs> you have no idea what people are going to want and they walk through your door. And of course, everybody's an expert on restaurants. So you get anything wrong and they, they want to drag <laughs> you over the coals, right? So, right. you know, I think that it's a business that only operates well with leaders who are good at getting people to believe and to engage. Right. And, um, yeah. you know, I think it's really, a, it, otherwise it all caves in. So, you know, there's no doubt that the, the industry and what I do in it has forged that in me. But I think that I, I'm very lucky. I teach a leadership class for the company and I, and I did for Biagis as well. It's actually a class I put together with the, the team at Biagis. And it's, it's two days that really get into like conflict resolution how to drive engagement, um, you know, motivation, things like that. And there's a whole lot of role playing in it. And that class now probably more than a hundred times, you know, it, it's a class for only, it maxes out at 12 people because, you know, for the six hours of role playing exercises, you can't have too many people there. Nobody would ever get a shot. And uh, so as, as the person teaching that over and over and over again, the basic fundamentals of what we're trying to convey as a company that we have decided are our values of leadership and communication in restating them all the time to young management, it helps keep them at the surface and make me better continually. Um, and I don't want to sound egotistically when I say me better, it's not like I'm some polished gem because let me tell you, nobody can piss people off like me on the wrong day. You know, I just, I overwhelm them at times, but I, <laughs> I think most of the time I keep that reined in and I'm, I'm pretty effective. Yeah. And I think that, I think I can say that about a lot of people in the restaurant business. I mean, I, I think we have the best leadership around because yeah. we have to do it in an operating environment that really, when you think about it, is insane. You know, you have no yeah. idea what people are going to want. They're going to want to come in at whatever order it's going to happen. And you're going to have to find a way to figure it out with all these different menu items and all these different tables and all these different wants and likes. And you're going to have to do it day in, day out without right. having any certainty, you know, and that's, yeah inherently yeah. crazy so you yeah. have to be really good to be able to do it you know so so in the progression of the last few months around mid-march around march 20th summer 23rd you developed a partnership with food it forward yes. or you created food it forward martha's table talk about yeah. that first i'd give a shout out to our parent company and, and just to backtrack a little clyde's the yeah. company which has been privately held since 1963 we this company was sold this year Mm -hmm. uh, to a company called Graham Holdings, which is right. the, the same Graham as the Graham family of the Washington Post. Um, they don't own it anymore. Bezos does. But it's a multi-billion dollar company that's DC based and are fantastic people. And we could not have done a better thing than to sell them because they have, they have already made us better. So that just needs to be said. But awesome. um, T Tim O'Shaughnessy, who is the very bright CEO of Graham Holdings, you know, he very quickly, as we got into this was, you know, there's a lot of people in DC with a lot of money. There's a lot of restaurant people who need a lot of work. And there's a lot of people who are going to need to be fed because hunger is going to be an issue. How do we connect that? And so, yes. you know, that's kind of, you know, he got it going, you know, he threw the idea out there like, like a good CEO. And then you yeah. know, we jumped on it and it was, uh, you know, the driving force, I'm putting it together, it was, you know, on, on our team, myself, and then a woman named Kim Ford, who's the CEO of, of Martha's Table. And we got it together pretty quickly. And uh, we found a really, really great guy to sort of build the website and brand it. And we found a way to process the, the payments. And So you know, will, found, you, will you tell our listeners what the daily operations of Food It Forward do? What, what sure. does it start? So, so Food It Forward is a way uh to our, well we have different partners because it's not just martha's table we have right. food at ford dc food at ford virginia and food at ford maryland <laughs> and in, in each of those jurisdictions 
we have distribution partners. You know, in DC, it's just one partner, it's Martha's Table, but in Virginia and Maryland, it's uh, Cornerstone, it's Link for Hunger, it's Inova Hospitals and healthcare mm. workers, it's mm. Howard County firefighters. We have a lot of people that we're distributing to. Yes. Meals that they don't have to pay for. These meals are paid by people who want to make the donations. So you can go to the website and we broke it up into three because most people kind of want to keep their money in their community. You know, the people yeah. in Virginia, yeah, they don't want to buy meals from Marylanders. Yeah. They want to buy yeah. meals for Virginians, you know? Yes. So, yes. Well, let me tell you, there is a there is definitely a Maryland, Virginia thing. Okay. And yeah. It's real. You know, yeah, like, for sure. So the Mason Dixon. Yeah. So you can go to the website and you still can. Anybody out there, please do go to Food It Forward. Virginia Some of our D fans have. Did you know that? I know. I have seen that. Isn't Thank that you amazing? very much. I know. Really it was so it. lovely. They love donating to yours, I noticed. Yeah. Anyway, so, go ahead. So, so you got you that know, people buy the meals and then yeah. we prepare them every day and, and send them out to our distribution partners. Now, it's not like a one for one. It's not like. How many meals that were bought yesterday? How many are we going to make today? We we let the bank build up a little so that we can have a steady stream. And, That's one. And so that so that whatever you're doing, the people can kind of count on it week in week out, and you kind of manage your numbers. Now, I will say, unfortunately, the giving really dropped off dramatically. So food at Ford DC came out really hot. Yeah. And, and then, you know, like all the people that we were able to get to, so many of whom are really just part of the Clyde's community, like the 150,000 people on our mailing list, you know, give, give, give. And then it kind of fades because then all of a sudden there were so many other models to give to. Yes, correct. So correct. We, we got pretty yeah. far. And then our donations went down faster than I was going to cut the meals off to food yeah. for DC. So, you know, our distribution is about 20 grand ahead of our money raising yeah. in DC. Um, wow. I took them down a little bit more gradually. So in the end, we're probably just going to eat that. But at least yeah. now we're at a point in all three jurisdictions where the level that we're donating, that we're distributing at, we can get enough donations to support it. It's not growing. It's not dropping. It's kind of stabilized. You know, right. we'll never get the 20,000 we're behind back, but, you know, it's very good. Job. Well, that was a question you had, Mina, were about the people who uh, participated in that program. I think you asked whether or not they were the same as the clientele that was normally a part of Clyde's family. Yeah, right. and, yeah. And a great question. And the majority of them are and have been and still are. That said, we've we've had a very good track record doing some large buy reach outs with local companies. So, you know, some of our beverage distributors have been like ten thousand dollar purchases. SAP has has been a I think a fifteen thousand or twenty thousand uh, dollar purchaser. So, you know that that's gone well, and and we'll continue to get those chunks, and they really help help keep us going. But uh, but it, you know, ultimately, most of it's the day in day out. I mean. You just got to remind people, you know, now we're just kind of like we send out another e-blast about Food at Ford twice a week. And each time we do it, some of the same people, they give again, they give again, they give again. Oh, isn't that lovely? It is lovely. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. fantastic. And, and so, let me tell you, Martha's Table is just, they are absolutely incredible. If you ever wanted to do a separate story about a incredible giving organization and what they're facing yeah. during a pandemic. What they're doing um, is is really incredible, and they're they're servicing, you know, some of the communities hit the hardest in D.C. You know, the towards the southeast of of, of D.C. And boy, they just they just never stop working there. I mean, they are they're yeah. going twenty four hour seven. Well, we will definitely look into them because it's so driven you know, and wonderful. It's kind of how it's kind of how we roll here. It's so sort that of, we don't know who we're going to talk to next, and we don't necessarily have an overarching theme, but somehow we get led to the next wonderful, inspiring story. And your, nice. yours is definitely inspiring, my dear. Stop um, blushing. No, but it is. I have to say it. I would say it if you weren't my brother, so I'm not going to hold back just because, you know, we're blood. Let's come now back to the present again. So now we're at plexiglass walls. Yeah. So what's the vision? What are you going to do? What's the vision for opening? Yep. Letting people back in the building. I think right now it would look like this. <laughs> um, 
You're a customer. I'm a customer. I walk. You're a customer. Yeah, um, I park the car. And I'm first, masked. First of all, you won't be let in the building unless there's space in the lobby to allow you in the building. Great. You can't just squeeze them in into the foyer to then like figure out you do or do not have a table. Book. Remember when we all, the whole group of us went to, um, where did we go? Which we restaurant? We went to the Hamilton and then we, we went, went down to the, the ride. And we the jazz was too boring, and we left right in the middle of a performance after making them give us the best table in the house. I'm still. I'm not sure the jazz was too boring. I think we'd had so much to drink that we knew we just wanted to keep talking, and people couldn't get the right seats. But they were so good to us. Yes. Your restaurant, but Mina, we walked in and had I don't know how many of us were there. Twenty five, something like that, maybe. Twelve, 15, but twelve, yeah. fifteen. So it seemed like a huge party to me, and. We stood in the lobby for a while with everybody else. It was packed. The restaurant is huge, Nina, and it was packed. So now when I go, as soon as I can get on a plane and come visit people again, and I go and I and we want to go there. So we show up with our mess, but we can't get into the lobby. So do we know? Do, so have we made a reservation? You will likely have made a reservation. All of okay. our restaurants accept them, and the vast majority of business we do is reservation. However, okay. yes. we have lots of bars in our restaurants too. It's really yeah. important to our whole experience, you know, the saloon right. dining. And no, none what of those was, tools are- What was the thing, the great thing, oh, I have it here somewhere. John Latham said a great thing at the very beginning of all of this. Well, it was actually Stuart Davidson who said it. It was Stuart Davidson who yeah. said it's it. More fun to, it's more fun to eat in a bar than drink in a restaurant. I think that is so right on. Is I've so never right heard on. that before. I never heard anybody state it that way. But it is the absolutely, it is absolutely our ethos. So yes, okay. So and so our bars are so important to the experience and our revenue stream, and and so that's been a big lobbying battle that we're trying to fight to get bar service allowed. And if it is allowed, instead of groups that can book a space and have six feet separating, I want to get more capacity using those dividers because they're actually safer than six foot and will let us do more business. So those dividers, which I've made, have not been approved anywhere. Okay. And in most jurisdictions, when they're reallowing restaurant service, they are not allowing bar service. Right. So in the last week, I've had Fox, NBC, Washington Business Journal, the BBC, USA Channel 9, all of them have done television interviews with me oh, wow. and the bar dividers. So... Everybody in D.C. is seeing these bar dividers and you keep running stories about aren't they clever? Because if, if it's out there, reality then becomes. Yes. Yes. So we're hoping because, uh, they, and, and truth be told, they are so good. I mean, they make so much sense because you can, it's a safer experience. And the way our bars are, they're separated from the dining room with walls too. So there'll be less foot traffic by the bar experience each bar pod would be booked and controlled by time <laughs> so nobody can just walk in and belly up yeah. and and yeah. the, the, the dividers will keep it safe and you could make six dividers for a bar for less than what one day's worth of sales for a bar wow that's They're really amazing. economical with the materials we use because it, so if, if i come in now wait a minute so i made a reservation i want to i actually want to eat at the bar and i've got four people with me what right. do you do with me? Well, if you had reserved one of the bar spaces, we we'd seat you up okay. there, and they would walk you to that. We'd walk you to your bar zone like it's a table. Yeah. Okay. And if you if you were a walk in and the bar zones weren't all booked, we would say, "Would you like one of the bar zones?" And we'd walk you up there. But but it's all controlled from the door, just like the dining room is. When you say very politely, "Would you like?" you know, a bar zone, a, you know, a, what is it? What did you call it? Bar divider? Yeah. Yeah, bar zone. We don't really have a word yet. We don't even know if we're going to be able to do it, you know? I know. So would you like a bar zone? What if they say, no, I would just want to sit there? They uh, can't. No, the, no, those are party for people who are enjoying dinner. They're like, they're like dining room tables. You can't just hang there. Right. Okay. So there is no more hanging at a bar. So if someone comes in and says, I just want to sit down, if you don't have a bar zone yeah. to offer them, they can't. Yes, no, correct. No, not happening. Okay. I would okay. love, to, I mean, I, I hate yeah. not letting somebody have somewhere to sit down, but you know, 
It's a pandemic for the love of it's God. It's the way it is. You know? No, but this is the thing, though. This is the new, uh, I'm just trying to get prepared for, you know, I'm just putting, yeah. I'm making me your customer. So, yeah. So, so, so how you would, do you, you would think, likely have? We how will do you change, get these approved? We will, we will. How do we get it approved? Well, the mayor had a hospitality task force making recommendations, which did not include me, and um, and so they put their recommendations in about a week ago to Mayor Bowser of D.C. And then I got the dividers fabricated last weekend, and we started with all the media push on them and i got photos and those then those photos got pushed in with the recommendation so and through the restaurant association of maryland and of virginia we also have it into both of those so we're very confident now that all the lobbying right. arms have pictures of those dividers right. so there's now a tangible means of looking at how to do bar service in a way that's different than just six feet because six feet with a bunch of people drinking at a bar no people don't know yeah, what's not going to do anything for you yeah i mean i noticed like in the grocery store people think three feet is six feet yes <laughs> i'm like no you, oh so yeah you're I, right you I, I that feel, plexiglass. yeah i feel oh. like wildebeest crossing the nile with crocodiles when i go into a grocery store it's like seriously i, I feel it. It's so, I feel so unsafe in grocery stores. Yeah. Yeah. Order food I from know. restaurants. <laughs> That's the theme there. That's what we do. You, know, you, you yeah. don't wonder how many different yeah. people have picked up that package and read the label before putting it back down. You know, anyhow, I, I know digress. That. Okay. I want to ask you, along with, you know, this wonderful talk about the bar zones and plexiglass and, there's something called the CRG bipartisan cocktail jar that I was fascinated by. What the heck? Tell me about that. Okay. Well, I did you see the one. image? I did. So all I want to do is order one. Right. So yeah. for, for those who can't obviously see the image right now, the graphic is of slightly cartoonish, but really detailed <laughs> picture of an elephant and a donkey sharing a cocktail over a Clyde's table. And that image was done about 20 years ago and wow. never really got much play in the company. And we're trying to get it some traction now. It's and, brilliant. And it's, it's something that I think is beautiful because A, it's, it's about a bringing together, regardless of, 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 you know, political outlook, which obviously everybody needs, but particularly, you know, the city we operate in. Yeah. Um, but I think it also is a really great image for now because, yeah. you know, it has the tagline, something we can all agree on, and it shows the elephant and the donkey drinking. And then at the bottom, it has 2020, which is kind of like saying, you know, doesn't matter what your political party, like now is the time We're to have a cocktail. <laughs> yeah. If there's ever been a time to have a cocktail, this is it, right? That's exactly and so, right. Um, and so, it. literally today, just finally close the deal on the price and we've got 5,000 more coming. And uh, so, you know, they're we're mason selling, jars, right? Like mason yeah, they're 16 jars. ounce mason jars. So we're going to be selling pre-made cocktails in them for, for delivery. Oh, oh I so just then, want one. I, I love that whole thing. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a set. You, you don't have to oh, okay. order the cocktail from LA. I, I got you covered there. You know somebody. You can but, FedEx it. But what we're going to do too is, you know, presumably, we're delivering a fair amount of cocktails now. We call them their, their pouch tails, and it's almost like a sippy, those little uh, Capri Suns with beverages <laughs> in them. Yeah. But that, oh, you, know, who, wow. you know, those are throwaways. Who wants to, that's not commemorative, for, you know. So we're going to be doing, you know, different mixed cocktails in this and, and selling them to go. And uh, But we're going to give, the price is going to be built into the drink, right? So the whole thing with printing and lid is about a dollar. You know, I had to get it to, wow. we call them, I had to get to a dollar less. So we're just going to price the cocktails like we would and then charge one more dollar than we normally would. So if, if let's say this 16 ounce margarita was going to be $12, it'll now be 13. Yeah. But if you return the jar, you get a dollar discount on the next wow. drink. Oh, so, it's like beer gardens in Germany, Mina. <laughs> yeah. I've been to a lot of beer gardens. Yeah. You know, because once you get to six, you're probably going, all right, that's enough. There's no more room in the cupboard. We don't yeah. really need to collect a hundred of these. Them. We oh, get it. Yeah. They're cute, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so hopefully the five thousand, 
you know, some of them will stay out there forever, but we'll keep getting some of them back with the deposit and not have to keep making them. You know? That's so lovely. Yeah, I love I'm, it. I'm, I'm, and, I'm very excited about it. I am too. And that I that just popped up this morning. So I was like, ooh, this is fresh. No, that was, that was yesterday. Oh, yesterday. Okay. Like, well, today, yeah. This morning was about the clap for quap. That's what I want to talk about to sort of close us out. I want you to talk about clap. what is clap for quap and how are your workers doing? Okay. So clap for quap isn't really a thing. It's just something I wrote in that communication this morning. So, so well, if you write it, it's a thing. You know, the, a lot of our workers, the majority of our workers are, are, are doing pretty well with unemployment. Yeah. And because our country has done a pretty damn good job getting the money out there, despite, you know, the things that are said about the frustrations and this and that. The yeah. reality is, is for, for most people, we're caught up now. And, you know, we have a lot of our hourly employees who are making $1,000 a week in unemployment. Wow. But we have a couple hundred who aren't, you know, more than yeah. a couple hundred for, for various different reasons. So, and, and it happens a lot. DC's tricky because you have so many people who like, live in Virginia, work in DC, oh, like just transferred yeah. there from Maryland. And, and when you have all that going on, it's so hard to get, you know, the unemployment, the bureaucracies all get choked or up and you can't get anything. Or you're in a household where the head of the household maybe is not a naturalized U.S. citizen, so nobody else in the household is, is eligible. Yeah. For. So, yeah. you know, we had hundreds of employees who aren't getting any unemployment. They're yes. outside the safety net and yeah. still trying, but the bureaucracy is letting them down. So QAP was the quiet <laughs> QAP was the Clyde's Wage Assistance Plan. Yeah, we gave it okay. an acronym because we thought QAP was funny. Like QAP QAP is funny. QAP, because QAP ain't crap. Um, yeah, that's very funny. But um, the reason we did it beyond the obvious that there's people who are an employee that need help was also to sort of have a parallel to the Paycheck Protection Program that was yeah. established through the CARES Act. And, you know, obviously we've seen a lot of press about large companies taking very big loans and then looking like the bad guys. And right. that's unfortunate because it doesn't matter how big you are, your balance sheet could be such that you're going under without all that money and a lot of employees are gonna be hurt. Yet, they are still vilified in the press. And, um, you know, we are now, the reality is we're not just a restaurant company. We're a business unit division of a large uh, mm. multi-billion dollar company, which is primarily not hospitality. Um, so while we certainly would have qualified for the PPP loans, yes. um, we didn't feel it was right to take it. Because the reality is this, we have a strong enough balance sheet and we have a strong enough parent company that we're going to get through this without that money. And right. there are definitely companies, particularly small ones, that without that money, they're, they're just not going to make it. So we're not the right ones to take that money, despite the fact Good that for you. Had it. So, you know, the, the beautiful thing about the Paycheck Protection Plan is that those loans did not need to be repaid as long as you met certain variables. And, you know, they're still trying to figure out what those variables are. It would have been great to have the money. We could have done a lot with it. Uh, but again, didn't feel right. However, we didn't want our noble intentions to end up adversely impacting those hourly employees Correct. who are great beneficiaries of the PPP program. And, um, you know, the rest of the employees are doing really well in unemployment. So we're, we really weren't um, about, about them. Now, post July, it's a different story when, you know, the FPUC and the PUA funds run out. But yeah. So what we did was we, we figured out a way to fund it and took on the debt. And, you know, we, we prior to this, our management had been working at 75% of their salary, you know, just yes. to make things meet. We brought them back up to 100% because they've done such a good job uh, building back their, um, building the carryout sales up. But what we did was we got to all the employees who were unable to, to get uh, unemployment. And we're giving them all each six weeks of pay. That's amazing, John. So, so they, get a, they get a really good infusion of some money. Yeah. And how did you allocate that money? Where did it come from? How did you build that into what you were doing? Well, I mean, it's it's the money came from, you know, we didn't we didn't take it off our balance sheet. We we got the cash from our parent company. 
Great. And um, so obviously in, in yeah, the right. end, it's, it's, I would imagine it's going to, we haven't really talked about where that's, whose balance sheet that's going to end up on, but you know, <laughs> it's debt. It's, yeah. it's debt. You know, we, yeah. any way you look at it, we, we borrowed $1.25 million to hand it over to our employees. So that'll, that'll make a good difference. And, and, you know, there's a couple other things we have going on um, because in, in most of our jurisdictions, you're, you know, most people are not worried about getting evicted if they're not able to make rent. So right. for most people, your housing is secure for a period of time. Right. We are feeding about 4,000 meals a week towards our, our laid off employees. Um, wow. So that if between like meals, you got that covered. Oh, and everybody who's on our insurance plan, hourly salary doesn't matter. We're paying 100% of the premiums right now. Wow. Jeez. So all of those. I'll work for you. All I know. Of those, right. We have almost 1,700, you know, temporary laid off employees. And so any of them on the insurance plan, they have no, no insurance costs right now. So between that, feeding them, now getting these paychecks out. They're good. I think, I think our team is doing pretty well. And, um, and we're, you know, the thing is you got to talk to them a lot too. That's the other thing, you know, a lot of the people who, you know, sometimes there's language barriers. There's a lot of things going on with their difficulty getting unemployment or their difficulty getting to them to let them know what we're trying to do with. Yeah. So it's taken sort of a grassroots to, to kind of get a hold of all 1700 out there and find yeah. out what's going on. And, uh, you know, we also have an employee assistance fund, which is managed separately. We use a third party on that for legal reasons. And, and it's basically fixed amount of grants that are given to people that they can apply for. And, you know, we've distributed about 200,000 through that. And that has been partially funded by us and putting a percentage of the carryout sales towards it, but primarily funded through giving, kind of like Food It Forward, like mm -hmm. the Clyde's community of customers, people like that, donating, a lot of our vendors and suppliers putting money into the employee assistance fund. So, you know, that's been pretty productive. So I think that, you know, our employees have felt well taken care of. And yeah. I'm highly confident that, they all are really proud and grateful to be working for Clyde's right now. And a lot of people who are in other restaurant companies are wishing they were working for Clyde's right now. Correct. Uh, which is a great way to come out of this, you know, yeah. from a recruiting standpoint. And, you know, like I said, Graham is a, a multi-billion dollar company and they're, again, cannot say enough good things about them. You know, it's rare to find such a financially enormous group that, leads from the heart in so many profound ways and they're positioned very well for a downturn like this um and mm. so i feel like as we come out of this pandemic from a competitive standpoint our financial stability i feel like everything that we've done for our employees uh in our culture our culture is just like like through the roof high right now i mean in, in many regards the distancing has made us all closer and yes. it's really quite the kumbaya. Um, and we're going to come back out, you know, once, by the way, I think normalcy will return. I, I think this concept of like being in public is never going to be the same is a crock of shit. I, <laughs> that's, that's, a bad, that's a bad way to say it, but because it sounds like those who think it are wrong or, or they're full of shit, they're not. I just, I have, and I don't know that faith is the right word, but I think the American consumer has a very short memory and a very large appetite. So, yeah. you know, yeah. I think that going from like the version of phase three of 75% occupancy to being back to business as usual is going to happen way faster than anybody thinks. I think there's a lot of pent up demand out there. And I think when wow. that hits the streets, there's going to be a lot less restaurants around, unfortunately, for those yeah. restaurants. because I hate saying that, that about opportunity because oh, but these are my brethren, you know. But, yes, uh, I understand. I, I feel like we're going to be in a really good spot on the other side. And, I'm uh, so excited, John. It, it, it really is fantastic to listen to this process with you and just sort of listen to how you process what your position is in it. And you you do work from places that are heart-centered and you do work from places that are soulful. And I think why I value this so much because you're my brother and I'm proud of you and all that, but I really value this as a listener. And I know our listeners will because 
you present a just a fantastic example of leadership and enthusiasm. I mean, it's just wonderful. It just makes the listener understand, oh, when times get tough, the imagination flourish, can flourish if you know yeah. that, right? Yeah. But also that you see an exciting future. It's in everything that you've described. And I kind of feel that way too more and more as I get further away from being shocked, you know, in, yeah. you know, and come out of shock, I feel more and more excitement about the future is going to ask for the very best of us. And that is going to be really exciting. And I love what you just said at the end that you think the American consumer has, you know, quite an appetite and it won't be long. So I just love this. Mina, is there anything you want to add? You know, just really adding on to that idea and thanking you because I feel like when we read stories about restaurants, especially in situations like this, it's about the ones folding and the, the workers who came to work and there was no one there and there's no safety net. And obviously, so many restaurants have different financial situations. They can't all do this. It's yeah. not all. You know, when that happens, it's not necessarily from a, a place of not wanting to provide. But yeah. I think it is amazing to hear the story of a company and a corporation and a COO doing everything they can to survive, be in a better place, and also make sure that that is happening for their workers as well. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for sharing the story because I think a lot of people are going to find that really inspiring and special to hear. And certainly more people should hear it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I would I, I would like to say this, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm in a good position to see how a lot of other restaurant companies are going about things and yes. how their leaders are thinking and what they're doing. And, you know, I, I'm proud to say that I, I think I'm closer to the norm than the exception. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful. I think we're an amazing industry that is full of just incredibly resourceful people. And, you know, it's a, it's a business where you stay so closely emotionally connected to the frontline workers. You know, it's a very flat kind of industry in that regard. And, and I think that's a powerful thing right now. And, yes. you know, you, you can watch so many of the popular shows on television, particularly in reality TV. And I think how they typically portray restaurant leadership is, is both unflattering and also completely disconnected from the reality of the professionalism that it takes to, to be in this business and make money, you know, particularly from a leadership standpoint. You know, the, the strongest, brightest, most emotionally secure and best people under pressure I've ever known are the people I know in this business. And, wow. um, you know, I think that, mm. I think restaurants are worth fighting for. I think they're worth trusting. I think with your meals, you know, that's the thing, you know, you look at, uh, I, I sometimes talk to people who are afraid to order meals from a restaurant. They're worried about the safety. So they go to the grocery store. You know, then I kind of make that example how they've, they've got it wrong and backwards. You know, the yes. restaurant so heavily regulated when it comes to protocols, procedures, and sanitation. Uh, the restaurants aren't allowing the public into their facility. You know, you right. look at restaurants and everybody's broken into teams where they never see each other. Like the people who work Mondays, they don't ever see the people who work Tuesdays. And we've got our teams rotating like that because if somebody becomes positive, we have to take the whole team out. You have to trace it. Yep. So yep. We're sanitizing every surface. We've rearranged our cooking stations for six foot distancing. Everybody's masked. Everybody's gloved. It's more like a lab than it is a restaurant. And that's the reality of our production. And then we're like putting a rubber glove on to put it on a table to not hand it to somebody, you know? And you can yes. add to a grocery store. What I'm describing, like every restaurant I know is doing this. Yes, correct. Right? Yeah. And and doing it, trying to fight for their lives because we have more employees per dollar sale than any industry in America. So we have way more to lose and we're trying to care and carry, care for and carry way more suffering right now. And it's mm -hmm. going to be a long way back to profitability, but restaurants can do it if people spend. If people spend, spend, order, yes. carry, actually, and when you order carry out, here's another thing, go pick it up. I mean, first of all, 20 cents on every dollar that the restaurant business is doing now that goes through an Uber Eats or a Grubhub, yeah. those, those companies, 
Yeah. And the typical margin for the restaurant industry when a restaurant's really humming is like 9%. So we're already giving more to third party deliveries than we even make when we're at full capacity. Right. So don't use them to get the food to you. Go get it. Plus, look in their cars. Do you want that food brought to you by the guy in a car that smells like smoke with 15 yeah. empty monster cans in the back seat? You know what I mean? Like, you don't want I do. That. You don't want I that do. guy bringing no. your food. No. So go get it yourself. Know that the restaurant acts like a laboratory in producing it. Pick it yeah. up yourself and let them keep the dollar on the dollar instead of 80 cents on the dollar. Oh, that's such a wonderful thing to end with. And I will say, John, that I've had a glorious experience picking up my food because I also, I love the people who run the restaurants and I at least get to say hi. Right. Do you yes. know what I mean? Thank you. And you just feel good. That's yeah. awesome. Keep that up. And keep it up after things open back up because, you know, restaurants and are going to reopen. But the road to profitability yeah. and viability, you know, restaurants yeah. are going to be struggling and going under for a couple of years. Yeah. And they're important to civilization. They're so important. We never, those of us uh, who aren't in the business, but just took for granted that enjoying food together with people in a great restaurant is yeah. one of my favorite things in life. Yes. Right? So we can't lose you. Oh, John. Okay, Love we you, have Mayor. to. We have to sign out because we can't have like a three hour podcast, yeah. but we could. We yeah. could. I think editing so, is going to be difficult. It's well, going to be we very difficult. We keep them long though. We keep them long, John. We, okay. We're not, we don't, uh, we, we don't have any bosses, you know? Okay. And right. So we do what we want and our listeners, they settle in. They're not yeah. in for a 40 minute or a 45 minute gig with, you know, commercials. They, they're they ready and they they go to part two and then they'll go to part three. So this will be wonderful. And I love you. And I thank you for taking this time because you are working, I am sure, 13, 14 hour days. And this is a big deal to give us this time. So bless you. Give my love to the family. And you take care of yourself, I by am. the way. Okay. I am. I Thank know you, you had a you had a wonderful thing where you you told all your workers one day I think it was mid April to make sure they were hiking and getting out there and I was waiting for you to tell them to go birding but um, well no there was one birding section of oh one there of was thing. so yeah you you must have not been reading that day but I don't want to push it too far it's it starts to become about me you know <laughs> okay but uh, hey you know thank you for doing this and you know for the listeners out there my sister Mary is an incredible incredible sister. This whole thing started with encouragement and she has from the earliest age and long before I was actually worth listening to, she always made me feel like my opinion matters so much. She is such an empowering human being and an incredible actress. Wow. Thank there. you. John. Thank you. I'm going to start crying because we're Irish. So <laughs> thank you so much for that. That was uh, a beautiful surprise. Mina, thank you. Nice job, um, Mina. Thank you. Okay, we're going to sign but out. At now. last, nobody likes a long goodbye. Yeah, I know. Let's do Love the Irish you. goodbye. Out. Okay. See ya. Bye, baby. Thank you. Hey, everyone. It's Mary. And Mina and I decided over the last few weeks to hold John's podcast for a bit, given what's going on in our country and in the world. And given that he was in D.C., we wanted to get an update with him regarding Clyde's and their situation in D.C. during this extraordinary moment of protest and social change. So here we have for you part two, uh, Mina Sharp and John McDonnell. Thank you. Hi, Mina. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Oh, you know, it's, every day is an adventure these days. <laughs> yep. Well, since we talked last, you know, it was what, two weeks ago, the world changed pretty significantly in a couple ways. Yeah. And I know Mary's been keeping me a little updated on what you've sent her, but for our listeners, we've kind of wanted to have an update on to what's happened and kind of what has changed since the last time we spoke, because so many things have. So as a follow-up to what we had talked about, 
in general, you were working on the plexiglass and the partitions and the restaurant and in-room dining. Has any of that changed? Has that all been put on hold with the world activities? No, actually, we, we got all that done right through everything that was happening. So right now, 100% of all the plexiglass is installed. And wow. our facilities are, are, are basically ready to accept people back into them. Um, you know, we had gone to, in the district, Virginia and D.C., they were all uh, had moved into a phase that would allow outdoor dining. Mm. Um, so obviously that was put on hold in D.C. <laughs> you know, actually our, our downtown restaurants don't have, have patios, but we got approval for sidewalk dining. So we oh, were wow. all set to kind of set up the sidewalk cafes to um, generate some more sales and income. And then obviously the protests came and you're not going to do outdoor dining during that because you know, for a little bit of geography, you know, our, our two busiest restaurants are on 15th Street between F and G and 14th Street between F and G, which happens to be one and a half and two and a half blocks from the White House. Oh, goodness. So with both of them, we're right on a path of just about every march coming by us. And, right. you know, in the early going, when a lot of the protested, protesting started, um, there was definitely some vandalism and looting and window breaking and graffiti and, and things of that nature. Nothing like dangerous, but um, but certainly a little, you know, a little scary um, at night. So, uh, you know, we kind of went from, okay, we're definitely not doing outdoor dining to, okay, a day later, carry out delivery people don't really want to come in here. So what's the mm. point? to okay windows are getting broken all around town we better throw some boards up right and uh you know two of our properties have really high windows you know like 20 foot windows and you know replacing windows is expensive replacing a whole restaurant that catches on fire somebody throws something flaming through the window is really expensive so you know we went to then you know boarding everything up downtown and then the next day, we got some really, really nice 24 by 36 Black Lives Matter posters and had a couple hundred of them made so that we could just kind of pepper the front of all of our, our facades. And, you know, we thought it would be good because so many people are marching right past our restaurants. And right. uh, so it's clear that we're taking a position and, and, you know, if nothing else, giving people momentum as they... As they hike on by because there really wasn't a lot of that and, and i don't think it's because businesses were reluctant to take a stand i think it was simply that things just evolved so quickly nobody right. you know, everybody's still trying to deal with um you know carry out and, and you know what just happened okay i'm boarding at my windows it's kind of hard when you're doing all that to have the frame of mind that should we all we should probably be showing support for this right <laughs> right and uh right. So, you know, we were actually kind of the first ones out there with that. And it was, it was pretty awesome, actually. Because Yeah, I've seen the photos. And I think with your permission, we'll share them on our website oh, so people can see it. Because it, it just was such a, it was a beautiful image to just see. And it was so well done and beautifully presented. Well, thanks. And uh, let me tell you, it was great putting them up. You know, hanging those posters with staple guns, you know, at times when, you know, there was over a two-day period where we're scrambling to get this done in the late afternoon. And there's a curfew at seven o'clock, but they really right. want people heading out of town at five o'clock. So we're like, bang, 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 trying to get them up before curfew, you know. And the streets are at when this is happening, you know, things are starting to build and there's a lot of energy on the streets. And right. there's a lot of people sort of getting ready for a protest battle, you know. And uh, so being in the midst of that and hanging them, you know, there was a lot of love, which was great. And then, you know, on Saturday, the protests, you know, the enormous crowds in DC and you know we were uh, giving out sandwiches to a company party majority I, I believe they're a political consultancy I'm not sure they spent like 70,000 this weekend buying sandwich meals things like that from restaurants wow so we just giving out to markers and, and so it was our restaurant it was Ben's Chili Bowl Haleo all these different restaurants produce a lot of food we were giving it all out in front of our restaurant so we were handing it out amazing and, it was pretty powerful, you know, to have the posters up and to be handing food out. You know, everybody sort of knew where the Clyde's restaurant group stood. And uh, it was a proud moment. 
and obviously there's a lot to be done, but I, you know, I, I don't know how you feel, but it feels to me like we're on the precipice of actually making some change, which um, is pretty exciting. So. Absolutely. The, the sustained effort and the worldwide effort, and it, it is an American problem, but the world is not going to let us drop it at this point, yes. which I think is exciting. And the, the people aren't going to let us drop it, which is good. We all need the momentum, and it's fascinating to me every day to see another area start to push in. Obviously, the police brutality needs to be solved and these other issues, but I think we're we're looking at changes systemically in many areas, not just this yeah. one, which is far, you know, far past time to have. Yeah. I'll say this, you know, D.C., through all these protests, the D.C. police force did an incredible job. I mean, they were really positive and supportive and there's all kinds of photos and video of of dc police taking kneel with you know kneeling with protesters and you know then obviously um the white house decided that they needed to bring in heavy artillery right um, but it didn't feel like anybody who was in the district thought it was really needed mm. and um and things remained you know throughout pretty pretty peaceful i mean the first two or three nights that were the most chaotic and probably the most dangerous feeling, we didn't yet have wood up and none of our windows got broken. Wow. And, uh, you know, there was a little bit of like spray painting uh, messages about our president on some of our walls. <laughs> and uh, our landlords got that washed off pretty quickly. But, uh, you know, it got a little hairy there. We had some security guards in the windows. We hired security guards to man the restaurants overnight mm -hmm. because. You know, if you're running up to a window and you're thinking about throwing a brick through it, but there's a person standing there and that person right. is a large person, you know, you tend to think twice and it, it, it worked, you know, they, they, yeah. they did their job until we got the wood up. But, but again, I, I, I've just been so impressed by, you know, uh, Mayor Bowser and, and the DC police and how they've handled everything and, and the level of class. And, you right. know, again, right. I think all the other forces probably, you know, maybe they were necessary, but it didn't, it didn't seem that way because largely it was incredibly positively, you know, peaceful. Right. Right. I think that's what we've all seen in the last few days is just once to take the pressure off of it, just how the intent is peaceful. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now, when windows get broken and looting happens, it's not protesters. It's people right. looking to take advantage of the situation when the police are busy. Right. Yeah. Well, we certainly saw that here in L.A. Yeah, I would think so. And everything. It was crazy. Now, tell me about these new murals that I saw in these pictures that uh, from this morning. Yeah. So, uh, you know, D.C. and different areas of the district have what are called bids or business improvement districts. And the downtown bid, which includes Penn Quarter, which is Chinatown, and that's where our Clyde's Gallery place is. And, you know, the Capital One Arena where the, the Wizards and the uh, in the, in the Capitol's plays there, in the Mystics. And, and so it's, it's kind of a thriving area. It's a very African-American-centric area, uh, culturally, uh, just in a lot of ways, residentially. And so the downtown bid said, hey, you know, in, in Penn Quarter, anybody who's willing, you know, who's got their windows boarded up, we'd like to do an art project um, to get, you know, murals painted you know, would you be willing to allow that on your building? And we were like, yeah, sure. And <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll pull our Black Lives Matter posters down for even more beautiful messaging. And it, and it really, uh, it, I don't know if you saw, did you see the photos? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And those were actually just photos of our restaurant's art. There's a lot more, you know, it's that it goes beyond just, you know, in, in front of our restaurants. So it's pretty powerful. And then, you know, when, when it's time to kind of, welcome people back and bring all this wood down all the murals are going to get repurposed to a, another part of town where they can be on display and then right there's a plan beyond that but I, i'm hoping there is because to me it seems like a great opportunity for like an auction for NWACP. Mm. you know what i mean yeah um, something yeah. like that i think that there's a lot of people who would really like to get their hands on some of that work and and would like to see it go you know produce some some funding so it's been a really cool thing and we actually you know things have calmed down enough that we can open up for sidewalk dining and so we're going to start doing that uh, tomorrow and thursday at our downtown properties but we're leaving all the murals up at the Clyde's gallery place so that everybody dining kind of has a you know they're dining in, a, in like a, in a street gallery which right. is really cool we're, we're very excited about that that's great you know it's such a beautiful 
way to change the feeling about having to board up the building, right? Because, yes. you know, this was I felt when I was driving through LA last week is all these places boarded up and it was just like, what is happening? And it's yeah. just plywood, plywood. So to be able to turn that into art, I find just really wonderful. Yeah. And such a, such a great thing to do for the city. And like you said, anyone who's walking through there and even in the photos, you know, people were taking pictures of them and posing by them. And I, I love it. Just yeah, turning it so into art where it, we need and, it. And even the stuff that's not painted is, I think there's going to be some positive coming out of all this wood. And, and I'm embarrassed to admit that I can't remember the name of the organization, but a lot of the wood in DC is going to an organization, we'll call it sort of Habitat for Humanity-like, mm. um, that's going to repurpose all the wood and use it for, for housing projects. So Incredible. Um, you know, that's a, that's a great thing rather than just, you know, sending it to some, you know, right. Lot, right. you know, trash pile. Yeah. So but, uh, what's next for the Clyde's restaurants down there? You said the ones right by the White House are reopening. Yeah. Everything else I assume has been running. So what's kind of on your, what's the next? Yeah. So, so, so catching you up from when we last talked, you know, all of our suburban restaurants, um, many of them had patios. Those that didn't, we rented tents and turned parking lots into, into outdoor mm -hmm. dining. And so we've been going full throttle with that very successfully, which has been great. A big uptick in sales. And, you know, we'll begin with the patio dining uh, downtown this week, as, as stated. And that's what we're in. You know, this, this phase one is, you know, outdoor dining with six foot distancing or 50% capacity of an existing patio and carry out only. Phase two will uh, actually for DC, Maryland and Virginia will allow for 50% occupancy within the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to provide six foot distance between tables and parties, um, which really means our plexiglass still doesn't really do anything for anybody. Well, it does because it adds a additional layer of safety. It doesn't get us any greater capacity just a, an added layer and and that's expected to happen you know between the various different jurisdictions unless there's a major turn in cases which is certainly possible considering all the protesting that's happening. right, right. Um, it looks like the weekend of the 19th i think friday the 19th 2021 those kind of three days the 19th through maybe monday the the 22nd is probably when in each of our jur three jurisdictions we're, we're going to be allowed to have people come back into the buildings. Oh, wow. Uh, and that's, um, I'll say this, you know, since the time that we have been closed down, uh, which was March 16th, you know, the greatest, I think, logistical challenge is now trying to ramp back up because, you know, a, restaurants like a lot of business are, are facing the the difficult issue of getting people to come back to work um, because oh, wow. there's some some very um, robust unemployment insurance benefits out there as a result of the CARES Act, which is a wonderful thing. But, you know, we have full-time servers and bartenders who had really good earnings and some of the high-paid line cooks. I mean, there's people getting, you know, $1,200, $1,300 a week right, in total right. unemployment and, and not exposing yourself to any kind of risk while getting it where... You know, when you come back to work, um, obviously, you know, they're allowing people to do that because, you know, we feel like the cases suggest it's, it's, it's the right move, but, but there's still inherent risk in it. And so, you know, right now we're in the throes of trying to do it correctly. And what correctly means is instead of just saying, okay, everybody come back, we are reaching out to everybody um, to make formal offers to return to work for our temporary laid off employees. And, you know, there's a number of different reasons that people can say they don't want to come back. You know, they could say, hey, I, I just don't feel it's going to be safe, in which case they can take a leave of absence. They can say, hey, I have a medical condition, which, you know, I'm high risk, and in which case they get FMLA, which means they can take a leave of absence and their job is protected. Mm. And then there's all the other reasons, like I'm not around, I'm down at the beach, I'm making a lot of money, I don't want to come back. And, you know, we have to extend two formal offers to them. If they refuse on both, we have to record that, which will ultimately be shared with, you know, unemployment. And, and those people then will be terminated. And we have to go through that with our whole team before we can actually hire people because we're going to have to hire people. Right. You know, right. we're going to jump up to 50% occupancy and volume and we won't have enough workers interested in coming back. 
but there are workers out there who do want to work. Mm-hmm. And we kind of have to go through all the steps with our temporary layoffs to see what we get from that before we can start entertaining any new employees to get us back to be able to handle the volume that's coming our way. And, you know, we're doing that while we're also retraining everybody on new service procedures and protocols and in both the kitchen and the front of the house. And, you know, everybody's going to be masked and gloved and requiring guests to wear masks, which, you know, is um, not always going to be well received and, and you know, how, how we get to try and manage that from a hospitality standpoint. And, and then all the sanitation procedures that happen within the building and taking people's temperatures when they show up at work and maintaining social distancing while you're working and reorganizing kitchen lines so that there's less crossover interaction between line cooks, which, you know, this is actually expensive stuff. And, you know, staffing sanitizers, porters who are sanitizers, you do nothing but sanitize services, bathrooms, et cetera. And you need a, a male and a female because, you, you know, for both restrooms. Right. So there's just a lot of complicated stuff. Um, it's not just like, hey, come on back and come back to work. It's come back to work, but work is different. Right, and we have to right. retrain you. And uh, and hopefully we'll have enough people to do it. So, you know, that's what they're, we're in the middle now of offering people their jobs back. We've got all of our plexiglass installed. And, and you know, the, the, the idea with the plexiglass is that when in all of the jurisdictions that we're in, going from phase two to phase three, when that jump happens, restaurants can petition for greater than 50% capacity. Mm-hmm. And that's where we believe the investment in the plexiglass outside of a greater level of assurance for customers, which is still worth the expenditure. But we believe that we're kind of the poster child for should be able to get more than 50% occupancy with the right. commitment we've made. And the plexi actually looks pretty good, surprisingly. It doesn't look like a hockey rink at all. And, and uh, you know, the bar dividers are cool. And, and so, you know, we're... We're in that ramp back up mode, and it, it yeah, seems yeah. like there's just you know one thing after another. We've we've changed our service procedures like five times since we've allowed people back on the patio. So it's just a daily change, but you know changing out every day is kind of what I think all restaurants and and probably all businesses, certainly in retail, have gotten good at. You know, right. change is constant right. and right. frequent. Yeah, you know, I had my first uh, meal in a restaurant all last right. weekend. And okay. you know, the was that outdoor dining or inside? Inside, actually. Really nice. Yeah, so they had a tent in the um, parking lot they had put up, but they put us inside. But it, you know, it was different. It was a little weird walking in and having the infrared thermometer at your head immediately, and the servers, you know, six feet away. So you're kind of shouting at, you know, the order. Right. But other than that, and it feeling, you know, a little empty because the tables are spread out. It felt wonderful to just yeah. have that normality come back and be able to sit with a couple friends and, you know, have a drink and eat and just, just have that again. So, yeah. I, and I'm sure everyone is so hungry for that. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. Kidding. Jamie and I just did the same thing. We, we had our first, it, it was outdoor dining, not because nobody can allow anybody inside here yet. And uh, it was just wonderful Sunday night. We went out for dinner actually after a 15 mile hike, we were starving. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, our first, we earned our first restaurant meal back, you know, right. Right. And it was just it's great. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm talking about how there's a lot of employees who, who are making great unemployment and don't want to come back. There's also a lot of employees who are making great unemployment and want to come back. Right. Even though they're going to make less money because, you know, they, they want to get back and get busy and they understand the things that we've done as a company. And, and that really, I mean, that's just great because if there's more of those than there are the people who like we can't get a hold of, you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, and it's it's pretty cool that people are taking the long view, and also just like working and being busy. And it's better to be busy and 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 come back than it is to stay at home and, and not make much money. Absolutely. Or and stay at home and actually make pretty good money. Right. So. Right. Well, this was great. Thank you so much for giving us kind of the the update. And I Absolutely. hope things stay calm and stay on the right track in DC and that opening goes too. well in the next two weeks. Yeah, we're we're actually holding on to a lot of our plywood. We'll see what happens in November. <laughs> <laughs> we this might need true. Kevlar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, might have to upgrade maybe plexi behind the plywood, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Who knows at this point? Keeping our options open, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's smart. All right. Well, Mina, thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Good to see you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.
Okay, listeners, so that is the update on John McDonald with Nina and myself and Lady Bam. This has been an amazing few weeks for all of us. Enjoy listening to my brothers navigating both COVID and Washington, D.C. during an extraordinary time of change and learning about the restaurant industry. I hope some of you out there, younger listeners, are interested because this is uh, obviously a really great field to be in. Okay, thank you. We love you. We'll see you soon. We've got Zinga Stewart coming up. We've got a part two with Katie Sackoff. And everybody, please stay vocal, stay healthy, and move forward. Okay, bye.